since September 11, 2001. Air Force Special Tactics Airmen have been actively engaged in fighting America's enemies. They engage these enemies at the sharpest end of the spear, on the front lines of battle. They have been awarded more than 500 Bronze Stars, more than 225 Bronze Stars with Valor, over 30 Silver Stars, five Air Force Crosses, over 100 Purple Hearts, and 17 have made the ultimate sacrifice. The successes of these men and those who came before them have culminated in the activation of the first ever Air Force Wing composed entirely of Air Force Special Tactics Airmen and support personnel. Special Tactics Airmen trace their origins back to the invasions of World War II and Korea, each rising from a need for highly specialized skills. The subsequent successes in Vietnam of these unique career fields further validated the importance of having airmen providing airmanship for air land, air strike, or combat rescue and recovery missions. The precursor of the modern special tactics teams started with a small band of combat control operators formed in the late 1970s. Now, now picture yourself being given a classified briefing or a program that you can't tell your two-star boss about, that you can't tell the other combat control team leaders about. You go out and you try to beg, bar, and steal people, and they say, uh, you want my two best guys, what are you gonna do with them? You say, I can't tell you. So when I went to those teams, there was naturally a lot of foot dragging. Not only that, I had to have had them come with their radios and whatnot, so they were taking equipment off the teams also. So that didn't make me a very popular guy, but I think after the while, people started to understand that at least we're starting to do something. This early clandestine team was unofficially known as Brand X because they came from several teams and didn't have an official designation. The real permanent Brand X team closed and formed in, in 1979 at Charleston Air Force Base. And it was decided to put the eight of us at Charleston Air Force Base because that's where they had to see 141 on alert to be able to go to Fort Bragg and pick up the strike force and then we could get on, we'd be on the airplane there. Strike sir, 2-1, it's a good strike, uh, you're on target. The first test of this secret team arrived a short time later when President Jimmy Carter ordered a military operation in April 1980 to rescue 53 Americans held hostage in Tehran, Iran. And I was in a meeting with Charlie Beckwith, uh, the ADO, or the uh, Director of Operations from Hurlbut Field, and the Wing Commander from Hurlbut Field, and some Ranger Commanders and myself, and uh, all by myself from the combat control side of the house. And in that conversation, Charlie Beckwith, uh, Colonel Beckwith said, you know, we need to get a set of American eyeballs over there and find us a place to land and uh, reconstitute the force, refuel aircraft, uh, on and on and on all about this. And that, at the end of his talk, he basically looked over and he says, we're going to send Carney over there. Would you guys land if we get Carney over there to do that? And of course, the natural answer was, you know, Yes, I mean, they would be embarrassed to say anything else, but yes. So that's when I first learned that they're sending me into Iran. It was at Wadi Kini that now the whole thing started coming together. You know, that now we kind of knew where, where the coach had been, which had been, you know, to go do that survey and stuff, because we were like two ships crossing a night. And so he kind of laid out the basic scenario that we were going to launch on a 130, we're going to be on the first 130, we're going to go into this dry lake bed uh, 10 miles out that, you know, with this big box, you know, he was going to activate the lights that were remote controlled that he dug in there, and then basically we're going to run that airfield, land 130s, and then the helicopters would be launching off the uh, carrier and join up with us and get refueled. Despite the best efforts of all involved, 
The mission met with disaster when a Marine helicopter crashed into an Air Force C-130. Three Marines and five Air Force personnel were killed. Late yesterday, I canceled a carefully planned operation which was underway in Iran to position our rescue team for a later withdrawal of American hostages who've been held captive there since November 4th. As our team was withdrawing after my order to do so, two of our American aircraft collided on the ground following a refueling operation in a remote desert location in Iran. The tragedy at Desert One validated the need for a specially trained special operations force. The Holloway Commission studied the failed mission and recommended the establishment of a new joint task force. The Joint Special Operations Command was formed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina on 15 December 1980. One of the actions the Air Force directed was to activate a small detachment of combat controllers and support personnel at Pope Air Force Base, North Carolina in early 1981. The name of the unit was Detachment 1, Military Airlift Combat Operations Staff. So that's when they uh, decided at Fort Bragg we would establish the MAKOS, DET-1 MAKOS. And I remember General Schultes, who was the first commander of the Joint Special Operations Command, who was my operational boss, asked me what MAKOS stand for, and I didn't know. <laughs> he says, well, you got the best cover going in the whole business. In 1983, the Air Force consolidated Special Operations and Rescue Forces under a newly created 23rd Air Force to better manage, equip, and train its elite warriors. The United States would eventually form United States Special Operations Command in 1987, and shortly thereafter, the Air Force redesignated 23rd Air Force as Air Force Special Operations Command. I guess the best thing of that, we've got the best special operations capability uh, today. You know, when you look at it, yes, it was a failure, but it would have been, uh, been a greater failure if we hadn't tried. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan ordered the invasion of the small island of Grenada, pointing to a 9,000-foot runway and sophisticated support facilities on the island President Reagan and others concluded that the island was to be used by Cuba and the Soviet Union for military operations threatening the sovereignty of the United States. So the concern was that we had students there at True Blue Campus and there's another campus that we learned later on that was students. And the concern was that they were in jeopardy. Special Operations Combat Controllers were again called upon, jumping into Grenada with Army Rangers to secure an airfield at Point Salinas and control aircraft, bringing in additional supplies and personnel. And that's when we, uh, the JSOC was handed the mission to go down to Grenada and seize the two airfields and rescue the medical students who were being held against their will. Once we uh, hit the ground, uh, obviously we had the uh, runway clearing responsibility. You know, we had uh, fairly significant resistance, you know, because they had the high ground. We finally got the runway cleared up to the ramp area where we felt safe enough that we could land at 130. The Rangers were running out of ammo, and so we made a decision, went back up to the AP Triple C and said, hey, you know, this portion of the runway is clear. Uh, we can land C-130s. We need 130 with this, uh, this combat load on. I always remember the time that, uh you know, it was late morning and on the radio comes Jeff Buckmelter and he says, well, we got the field under control. <laughs> and so you're cleared to start landing airplanes. And I said, gee, that's just great because it took a big air traffic control burden off of my hands. In early 1984, the Air Force integrated pararescuemen into the Special Operations Oriented Detachment 4, Numbered Air Force Combat Operations Staff, DET-4 NAFCOS, the forerunner of today's 24th Special Tactics Squadron. So after Grenada, Coach Carney uh, got to, together with the Headquarters Military Airlift Command, General Cassidy, and said what we really need is pararescue men uh, to join the combat control team or join the, the, this team at uh, 
at the JSOC, at Joint Special Operations Command, to develop a search and rescue capability. And obviously the PJs was a natural to bring them against our missions, uh, particularly when we're jumping on these airfields and all over the places we're going, the chances of injuries are pretty damn high. Unbeknownst, I believe, to some of the original controllers, I don't think that they knew that Colonel Carney's big goal was to integrate the two career fields. And that was his goal, and that was my I uh, guess mission given to me by uh, General Maul and then Colonel Carney to make this happen, to do my part to integrate pararescue with combat control and uh, write the roles and missions and figure out where they need PJs and do my best to make it happen. Whenever you get soft together, um, dissimilar units and try to merge them into one, you're always going to have issues that you have to work out personality conflicts and the like. But uh, the longer we work together, the more we came to appreciate each other's skills and uh, capabilities, what, uh, what each AFSC, what each individual could bring to the uh, unit as a whole. It's always difficult when you bring in proud people with A personalities that come from one brand of cloth, uh, but it works. As you take a look at two small groups trying to come together and uh, one pitted against the other, but then when you realize that they had so much more in common and together they could be one plus one equals three, but at that particular time, they didn't think that was how it should work. The problem was that we couldn't keep calling the combat control squadron when we got uh, radio maintenance people, we've got all kinds of uh, support people, plus now PJ, so uh, the special tactics title come to my mind because of the fact that Back in the general, I mean, Colonel Grimes days up at XOZ, Eve's comments were, we need to come up with some special tactics. Uh, in other words, we're not gonna jump in with 27 lights with a contingence of all these big radios and whatnot. We gotta come up with some specialized tactics. So that's really where that term germinated from, and it fit. On October 1st, 1987, the 1720th Special Tactics Group was activated under 23rd Air Force at Hurlburt Field, Florida. It was very emotional for me to look there and see all those berets assembled, standing tall, but standing tall as one with different colored berets in their head. And uh, that, was, that was really special. And a matter of fact, after the ceremony, Colonel Carney said to me, he said, uh, you had a tear in your eye. I said, well, it was cold and windy out here, John, but I lied. In 1989, President George H.W. Bush ordered the invasion of Panama and the capture and removal of its de facto national leader, General Manuel Noriega. The operation was the first major test of the newly integrated Special Tactics Units. Going into uh, Panama, we, we used three squadrons to basically seize the airfield and run them. One up at Tacustacuma, the biggest one. Uh, one of them up in Riojado, and then the 21st, uh, combat Control Squadron out of Pope Air Force Base uh, come in with the 82nd Airborne to run the airfields. In Rio Hato, the first parachutists into Rio Hato were PJs and controllers and a mini bike that belonged to us. <laughs> so uh, we led the way first there. In the Panama operation, these guys were just uh, critical to that operation. And in fact, there were a couple of guys that went with the shooters to rescue Kurt Hughes in the prison Modelo there, right downtown Panama. And, they were controlling all the fire, the fires into into and out of that, you know, into that place. And uh, the, the Commandancia, we had AC-130s overhead and Little Bird gunships. And so that was an extremely successful mission on both parts of the 21st Air Force, 23rd Air Force, and the 24th Special Tactics Squadron, where we actually ran the airfields uh, and the airdrops. This was the first in-action combat action with PJs. And I could tell, you know, this ain't a bad mix. We got a lot of skills to bring to the fight, and together we can uh, we can make things better for the assault force that we're attached to. I mean, it was clear after Panama that that um, Colonel Carney had a great idea when he put everybody together. I think particularly in Panama, uh, you know, we learned a lot of lessons there about uh, special tactics being that. Uh, that battle space integrator that uh, both maximizes the effects of air power but also maximizes the effect uh, of, of the fight for the joint uh, for the joint war fighting commander. Less than a year after the invasion of Panama, 
Special Tactics Airmen were again called upon to utilize their special skills in Desert Shield and Desert Storm. When we get into uh, Saudi on the first wave with uh, the first SAL, uh, we had to find a way to bring the force over. Um, there was a brand new airfield that hadn't opened yet, uh, King Fahd International, and we went up there and surveyed that. The tower wasn't ready yet, so we took our portable radios. We worked very closely with the Special Operations uh, uh, Task Force, and uh, we were working with the Brits in small teams. Uh, Bones Jones was working with the Brits, uh, who did some insertions to take out some uh, communication lines and uh, satellite lines. So we were the force that brought in the force. We were first there. We brought in aircraft every day. There was a time where a monthly count, there was one month, I remember, that we had more traffic than O'Hare International. And combat controllers were on portable radios doing that air traffic control. Once again, we proved that uh, we are definitely a combat multiplier with our abilities to not only communicate, but also to provide direct air support when it's required. In October 1993, the special tactics concept would again be validated. Operating as part of Task Force Ranger, the airmen and other task force members executed an operation that involved traveling from their compound on the outskirts of the city to the center, with the aim of capturing the leaders of the Habar Jadar clan, headed by the warlord Mohammed Farah Idid. It started turning nasty within Mogadishu after well over a year of supplying food and, and aid to the people of Somalia. Shortly after we put our bags down, the mortars started falling, and uh, the general said, well, we'll have none of that. So we decided to go downtown and, and uh, take some things away from them, so we did. Uh, it was shortly after that, on October 3rd, is when, the, when the, uh, we did a mission down to the Olympic Hotel, and, and we had actually a couple of helicopters shot down. When the, uh, the first Black Hawk was shot down, they were putting together a ground rescue party and I just happened to be standing there with my radio and rucksack. Um, a weapon was loaded, so they uh, told me to get in the vehicle, and I rode out the, uh, the front gate with a couple of the Army guys, try and do the, uh, the, uh, the rescue. Uh, unfortunately, we were ambushed just after we hit uh, K4 Circle, and uh, some of the vehicles got shot up pretty good, and we got turned around had to make our way back to the airfield. As we cleared out the wreck, and we were got really, we were pretty lucky at our wreck. I mean, unfortunately, we had a few dead, um, and they were dead when we got there. Uh, and then we had a few guys who were alive buried in the wreck, and we were able to get those guys out. And honestly, they were not severely injured. We went back out that night, and we stayed out all night, and got everybody from downtown and made sure Everybody made it back to, uh, to the airfield. That night we lost 18 American soldiers and I believe uh, another 70 some odd were wounded. Tim Wilkerson was awarded the uh, Air Force Cross for his action and Scott Fales and Jeff Bray were awarded Silver Stars. And they did uh, incredible things and I think that Air Force Cross is the first one that had been awarded since the Vietnam conflict. Being a part of the soft mission, and I, I, yeah, I can't say enough about it. I mean, I, I love it. I love the ST community. In 1996, the 10th Combat Weather Squadron was reactivated at Hurlburt Field, Florida, and placed under the command of the 720th Special Tactics Group. So now you've got combat weathermen, combat controllers, Pair rescue into a very unique unit where now one plus one plus one is equal four. And I think the synergism of bringing all those people together has really made them uh, that much more attractive to the warfighter. There's no other single element that has a more, more profound impact on mission success than the weather. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. It's a special uh, capability, and we have to insist that we keep, uh, keep that capability in our forces. The terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in New York City and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. 
on September 11, 2001, pushed the United States Special Operation Forces to the forefront of the war against terrorism. Special Tactics Airmen were among the very first Americans with boots on the ground in Afghanistan, paving the way for the follow-on invasion. On September 11, 2001, I was the Director of Operations of the 24th Special Tactics Squadron. We were uh, far deployed uh, out of the United States on an exercise. Uh, when, the, when the event happened, I just landed on the C-130, and uh, the team met me and told me what had happened. Uh, we immediately packed up, and the next day, I think we were one of the few airplanes that was flying across the Atlantic. And I came back into North Carolina, began planning, and then I redeployed in October of 2001 uh, to initiate the start of Operation Enduring Freedom. I remember sitting at home and watching everything unfold on TV. And I got up and I said, well, I guess this means, uh, this means our country's gonna go to war and I should do my part. So um, went to work and called and said, hey, I'm gonna go to a recruiter's office today. And they said, okay. Went over to the recruiter's office and signed up. 9-11 was a game changer for a number of things, uh, particularly in that uh, if I can phrase this correctly, the war, the conflict that we had all of our lives been trained for uh, began to unfold itself uh, in Afghanistan for special tactics. And um, for me, it was very important that we get the group and we get special tactics, the 720th group and the special tactics squadrons uh, firmly uh, embedded in, in Operation Enduring Freedom. One of the things in the past we had struggled with was uh, cooperative relationships between the, the, all the different special operations units that we work with. Uh, in the 2005 time frame, I think we had gotten beyond all that. The mission was uh, so strong and, and the requirements for us to work together uh, overwhelming to the fact that it, it overcame a lot of the institutional boundaries we'd had in the past. These guys are unbelievable. It's an all-volunteer force for one. They joined when we were at war. And then you throw the training pipeline on them that, that's very difficult. And then we ask them to operate in a joint environment on their own with guys with much more rank and experience. Factoring all that in, I would say, you know, you, you just can't make this stuff up. It's unbelievable. Our special operations force are the worst nightmare of America's worst enemies and you're making us proud. Air Force Special Tactics experienced tremendous growth and development during operations enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom. You know, since 9-11, we've seen an absolute um, amazing evolution of our capabilities on the battlefield. I think it's became, become clear that the adaptivity of our force, uh, the flexibility of our force combined with those other traits uh, of selflessness, commitment, ingenuity, a very technical focused force that remains tied into that central piece of bringing air power to bear in the ground special operations fight uh, has proven decisive on almost any battlefield the nation uh, employs. Now, you know, after 11 years of combat, uh, you know, the trust and confidence in the entire special tactics career field where most guys are known by their fir first name or, you know, you know, your two digit call sign there. Is, uh, is absolutely phenomenal. What, what's frustrating is you're a victim of your own success because every time you produce one, you know, everybody wants one. Along the way, it took some direct leadership involvement on how the Air Force recruits, selects, and trains its special tactics airmen. The other thing we did, to be honest, was we said, look, uh, you're taking in too many people and not graduating enough. It, it's it's a, a disease that can happen when an elite group says we're elite because we reject so many. We said, you know, if you're not going to get them through, don't hire them. They took that to heart. We were faced with a, a dynamic problem in that the throughput for particularly combat control was not great enough to sustain the career field. And the, the, the numbers had already been run on that. So both uh, the Air Force uh, and particularly AETC were coming to AFSOC going, what are you going to do about this? So General Holmes came out with a plan to uh, change our pipeline almost back to where it was uh, originally. And that worked to, I believe, a limited degree. We still weren't getting the manpower that we needed. 
And at that point, I believe it was uh, Chief Ramos and retired Chief Wayne Norad kind of thought, hey, how about we hit the, the recruiting piece to help get the right guy in the front door so then that new program would have a, a better result. The attitude of the guys coming in the, in, in the front door uh, just shows how good your uh, recruiting uh, process worked. Uh, you know, it didn't used to be that way. You never could guarantee who that person was coming through the door, which meant you couldn't guarantee, you know, could they make it through the training. I mean, we, on the air crew side, we had the same problem, but we, we can't control the front end. Somehow you guys got control you know, all the way from AFPC through AATC to make sure that it was a better student coming through the door and it was an absolutely phenomenal, you know, capability coming out the door. In 2008, the Air Force approved a new specialized career field for combat weathermen, designating it as Special Operations Weathermen. This change allowed for a new formal training pipeline, codifying regulations and funding necessary to resource and field such a capability. The 17th Air Support Operations Squadron of 61 Tactical Air Control Party members was added in 2008, bringing additional manpower, experience, and joint terminal attack controller capability to support U.S. SOCOM forces. October of 2008, they were given to us by ACC, and General Worcester finally just said, just take them, doesn't matter what, what or how they come. Best thing ever happened, best marriage you could possibly imagine, and what we always do, we made it work. We couldn't do the joint terminal attack control job without those guys because we didn't have enough qualified CCT uh, JTACs. So what do you do? You train Army guys to do airmanship? You train SEALs to do airmanship? Or do you bring in more airmen that know how to do that job? That's what we ended up doing. Initially, we took the Special Forces TACPs at the group, at the Special Forces groups. They were dissolved into the units, the 2-1, the 2-2, and the 2-3. And then we began having a selection program twice a year for uh, TACPs to come to STS or the Ranger TACP side of the house. They went from primarily a staff role in special tactics running JTAC programs to as recently as two years ago. Uh, we had our first two TACPs complete our operator training course uh, as a tier one graduated operator. And they were absolutely fully integrated with both the Navy and Army counterparts that we run with term that I like to always say when the Army runs out of HUA, uh, where they're 911, um, you know, daily our guys are uh, keeping uh, the people that they support alive. I think having all four career fields working side by side is huge. It's, uh, I think in years past there were distinct lines between the career fields, some, uh, which kept us from reaching our uh, full potential and blending the career fields together into units at the STSs, uh, I think it's gonna amplify what we're capable of, no doubt. Special tactics operators have unique skill sets that are not just significant in combat, but also in humanitarian relief operations. Special tactics airmen played critical roles in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina along the Gulf Coast. Following a devastating earthquake in Haiti, and in the wake of a powerful tsunami in Japan. They continue to live up to the motto, first there, that others may live. A decade of being at the forefront of two wars and experiencing unparalleled growth has caused special tactics leaders to reevaluate the current force requirements and organizational structure. We switched from one squadron to two squadrons and a group headquarters and never missed a beat, never pulled our folks off the battlefield uh, and never dropped the ball on the mission. Uh, finally, our sister units, our, our headquarters elements are seeing the 724th as an 06 headquarters that can achieve effects um, just as its sister service units can achieve effects on the, bat on the battlefield. The ST community and my time at JSOC again participates with all of the other tier elements and is a critical uh, piece of every operation we do. My concern was that they didn't have kind of professional mobility upward. So as we established the 724th um, Special Tactics Group, uh, the natural, the next natural uh, evolution was really to establish the wing. The 24th Special Operations Wing was activated on June 12, 2012 as one of only three Air Force active duty Special Operations Wings 
and the only one comprised almost entirely of special tactics operators and combat support specialists. Standing up the first wing, first special tactics wing has been a long time coming and I think we all dreamed of this um, years and years ago. Uh, to be led by an officer that was uh, that was selected, vetted, and uh, has operated within our community, who understands the men, who understands the mission. Um, it's, a, it's a huge morale boost uh, for all of us. Been a lot of hard work done at the staff level to make it happen, and the, and the troops doing the job out there. So these Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Air Force, these type of people go, man, we're getting a bang for our dollar right there. The beauty of the growth to the, to the 24 Sal uh, and the, the second group and the stand-up of the wing is that we now have more resource focused on taking care of those people, assessing, recruiting, selecting those people, and making sure that we get those people where we need to. And that's enabling them to get nose-to-nose -nose with the enemy so that we can conduct our business. The thing that Special Tactics brings to the fight for uh, the operational commander is the ability to have absolute assurance that we're going to succeed in what we said we're going to do, reduce the risk to the mission to him, and guarantee a much higher level of success because he's brought a special tactics airman to do a unique skill set for a mission that is, uh, is very complex and uh, it involves integration of a lot of different resources. Whether that's a, a special tactics officer on an airfield running an airfield seizure or a combat support airman doing a unique technical skill on the battlefield, uh, it's something that's unique to what our community provides. This is all a work in progress. And everybody wants to grow. But what we have to help this community do is it performed superbly in the circumstances it found itself and learned from it. And it grew through it. It now has to sit back and say, what's our role for the United States Air Force for the long term? So what is it that the Air Force will depend on us to do for them, for the larger picture? Because as uh, John would say often, the war we fought was unlike any other war and the next war won't be like this one. I mean, I can tell you I've been a, a huge supporter of the SD community really since my first dealings with them as, a, as combat controllers. Uh, there was a, a certain um, uh, you know, brotherhood that was developed between the SEALs and the, and the CCT and then the SDs early in my career. Uh, I have tremendous respect and admiration for the ST officers and the NCOs. Uh, it, it really is one of our premier soft capabilities, and uh, and I'm just glad we're continuing to grow it and uh, and put more ST operators out on the battlefield. And I think I'd just like to sum up by uh, thanking all 1,400 members of this very very special community out there uh, for uh, being a part of something bigger than yourself. It's never about you in special operations. It's always about something else, someone else. It's a virtue that is uh, sort of lost in the contemporary culture, but one that this community sustains, and I couldn't be more proud of being associated with this, uh, with this group over the years.